Hello and welcome to the Chamber Foundation's Path Forward series. It has been nearly two and a half years since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Since that time, we've witnessed the private sector's stunning capacity for innovation in the race for vaccines and therapeutics. We've also experienced the ebbs and flows of new variants, shifting global hotspots, and the question of what comes next in this period of extended uncertainty. It's clear that the crises we face are far from over and that we must reconsider how we think about the end of the pandemic. Today, we'll unpack the current state of COVID-19, including what we need to know about reinfections. We'll also discuss updates on therapeutics and current COVID case projections for the fall. Shedding more light on this subject today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Ashish Shah. Dr. Jha is the White House COVID Response Coordinator and a physician, health policy researcher, and the third dean of the Brown University School of Public Health. He's also offered to offer us some practical advice today, so we have a lot to go over and we'll jump right in. Dr. Jha, thank you for being with us. Suzanne, thanks for having me here. Absolutely. So maybe I could just start with a broad brush. What is the current state of COVID in America and globally? Um, yeah, so thank you. And thanks for, again, having me here today. Um, you know, when I look back to where we were 18 months ago, when the president took office versus where we are today, um, really very, very different situation that we find ourselves in, right? That uh, deaths are down about 90% from January of 2021. Um, even if we go back to last summer, uh, we were in the middle of a Delta peak right now. Uh, deaths are down about 75, 80% from where they were last summer. So we are in a much, much better place. And if you begin by asking sort of, why are we in a better place? We are in a better place because people have gotten vaccinated and boosted. We've got treatments that are widely available. Um, so while we continue to fight this pandemic and we still have a lot of infections out there, about 100,000 people getting formally identified as having been infected. We know lots of people get tested at home and we never get those uh, numbers quite captured in our system. Um, Hospitalizations are down, deaths are down, businesses are open, schools are open. I expect uh, we'll do everything we can to make sure every kid is back in school, in person, full time this entire academic year. I think that's going to happen. So much, much better place. Now, let me just finish off by saying um, we still have some work to do, right? We still have some work to do in front of us. Uh, BA5 is the Omicron subvariant that is now dominant, about 85, 95, 90 percent of cases. Uh, it's incredibly immune evasive. It's uh, very contagious. Uh, people who were vaccinated six months ago, seeing lots of breakthrough infections. People who got infected six months ago, seeing high rates of reinfection. Um, so that's a challenge we have to manage. Still four or 500 people dying every day. It's way too much. Uh, you know, annualized, it's about four or five times what you get in a typical year with the flu. So that's too much. Plenty of work ahead. But I think we would be remiss if we did not look and see all the progress we've made as well. I appreciate that that answer. And I want to ask you the next question kind of in two phases. One is, we know the CDC just updated the guidance. And I'd like to ask a question in two phases. First, what prompted that change? Was it the change in situation you just described? And then also, if you might describe what the current guidance is. So you get the phone call. I just tested positive. What are we supposed to do now? Yeah, great. So let's talk about the CDC guidance, what motivated it and what does it say? And then let's get to that question of the dreaded phone call that I've gotten from lots of relatives and friends over the last uh, two years. I just tested positive, what do I do? All right, so what motivated CDC? Well, the, the, the guidance has changed really because of two reasons. Um, one is we have learned a ton more in the last six months, eight months about how the virus spreads, what are the major modes of spread? Uh, and what are the things that we can do to protect ourselves and those around us? And I'll talk in a second about what that has meant in terms of new guidance. The second is, of course, the situation has changed in terms of how widespread vaccines and vaccinations are, uh, what's happening with variants, uh, what's happening with therapeutics. Put all of that together and CDC felt that it was time for an update. 
So what did they say in their update? Well, in general, at a high level, what I would say is that the CDC guidance uh, sort of relaxes a lot of the restrictions we've had. Uh, tells us that there's a really new way of thinking about who is going to get infected. We used to spend a lot of time talking about six feet of distance, 15 uh, minutes of being together. You know, we realized that's actually not the right way to think about this. That's not the the kind of the most accurate way to think about this. Um, what we know about this virus, particularly um, these very contagious subvariants that are out there right now, is it's really about the quality of air you're breathing around you in a crowded indoor space with poor ventilation you can get infected within minutes. If you're outdoors um, with obviously by definition, good ventilation, uh, you can be outside for long periods of time and not get infected. So context matters, crowds matter, ventilation matters. That is a, a major new update in the CDC guidance. The other major updates are less quarantining, more about even if you're exposed, you can go on with your life. If you've been exposed, you should wear a mask, test, but, but you don't have to quarantine. Last but not least is there some important changes about isolation, uh, about being able to test and to end your isolation earlier to stop wearing masks if you have multiple negative tests. So there are important updates, but generally moving us closer to a more normal way of living. Now, I'm going to go back to your other question that you asked me right at the end. Very, very practical question. Um, I have, you know, I have two parents who are in their 80s. Um, and so I actually, for a long time, I've been thinking about what happens the day I get that phone call from my parents. And sure enough, about a month ago, six weeks ago or so, I got I got the call. Uh, my mom called that my dad, dad had not been feeling well and just tested positive. And then 12 hours later, my mom called again and said she had tested positive. Uh, thankfully, I laugh at this because they both are doing well, uh, thankfully. But, you know, we had a plan. They were both double vaccinated and, 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 and double boosted. So I knew that already they were going to be at lower risk. Um, I think it's extremely important that people get treated if they're eligible. And the we've worked very closely with FDA CDC to clarify the eligibility criteria. Anyone over the age of 50 or anyone at elevated risk of having complications is eligible to get Paxlovid. Uh, Paxlovid is a terrific oral antiviral. It works really well dramatically lowers risk of hospitalizations and deaths. And so what I would recommend to people is if you've not gotten it, or even if you've gotten it, let's say a long time ago, um, you should have a plan. Who, who's the doctor you're going to call? What pharmacy will you go pick it up from? Uh, if you don't have a regular doctor, you could go to covid.gov and find a test to treat site, a CVS or something else. Um, but there are lots of ways of getting Paxlovid. Paxlovid is free because the government has purchased it. Um, but we want to make sure that people are getting treated so people are not ending up in the hospitalization in the hospital or obviously worse. So let me ask you two kind of related questions. One, um, we've talked a lot about vaccines. We've talked a lot about the efficacy of vaccines in especially reducing severe illness and death. How are we doing? What is the status, the current vaccination rate across the United States? How are we doing? Yeah, great question. Um, so about between 80 and 90% of adults have gotten at least one shot, close to 90% for one shot, uh, about 80% for two. Um, once you get to boosters, the numbers start coming down. Um, but, you know, a vast majority of Americans have gotten, uh, have gotten vaccinated. That's the really good news. You have to go back and remember that these vaccines were developed for the first time in February, March of 2020 when the dominant variant, the only variant, was the original Wuhan strain uh, that was circulating around the world. That's what the vaccines were built against. What we have seen is dramatic evolution of the virus since then. Um, you know, initially we were hit with the alpha wave last spring, then we got Delta, then we got the big Omicron wave, and then Omicron subwaves have come each after uh, another. And the virus that's out there right now is BA5, and it looks really different in lots and lots of ways from the original strain that we built the vaccines against. Now, the good news is our vaccines are still doing a remarkable job of keeping people out of the hospital, particularly out of the ICU and, uh, and, and worse, right? So that's amazing. But the impact of these vaccines on preventing infection has declined over time because of this evolution. And so the good news here is about two months ago, uh, FDA authorized the building of new vaccines, uh, which should be arriving in the next few weeks. These are bivalent vaccines. They have part of the original strain, 
but they have a part of BA5. This is the virus, the virus that's out there right now, the dominant virus out there right now. And again, we're going to know more about this in the upcoming weeks. And, uh, and these vaccines will become available by early to mid September. But the big picture bottom line is these are substantial upgrades in our vaccines in terms of their ability to prevent infection, to prevent transmission, uh, certainly to prevent serious illness and death. And those vaccines are coming very, very soon. And so it's going to be really important that people this fall and winter get the new shot. It's, it's designed for the virus that's out there. And again, based on everything we have seen so far, all the data suggests uh, it should be highly effective against the new variants. So I, I can see my phone already blowing up with follow-up questions to that. And they're really in two buckets. One is you know, do we have a supply for this kind of demand and will people be able to get it? Will it be rationed by age or, or risk category? And is this for people who have not yet been boosted or for anyone? Yeah, let me get to the second one first because it's easier. It's gonna be for everyone. Um, I've been boosted, I plan to get one. Uh, my parents have been boosted and they got infected recently. I plan to recommend that they get one. Uh, it should be, it's gonna be for every adult. And we'll figure out that with the kids stuff, we're going to have to figure out. Again, this is all contingent on FDA and CDC signing off. That's all going to happen in the next couple of weeks. But assuming that that happens, it will be for everybody. Um, now, in terms of supply, here is um, here's where that stands right now. Um, as you may know, Suzanne, we went to Congress uh, in the spring and said, look, we need resources uh, to make sure we have plenty of vaccines and therapeutics for the fall and winter. Unfortunately, Congress did not come through with funding. And so we faced a pretty tough dilemma late spring into summer. We saw Germany, we saw the UK, we saw all of these countries buying vaccines for the fall and winter, and we weren't even really in negotiations with these companies. And we said, well, that's unacceptable. We've got to act. So we have taken money from other really important priorities, like having a stockpile of tests and having a stockpile of personal uh, protective equipment, PPE, took those dollars and put them into buying vaccines for the fall and winter because time was running out and we needed to get in there and make sure that America was not way behind every other country in the world. Um, so the good news is we've been able to do that. Um, we're still working on trying to pull more resources from other places. I would like to get to a point where every adult in America who wants a vaccine uh, can get one. I'm hopeful we will be there. We're not quite there yet in terms of how many vaccine doses we've been able to buy. What's really limited us uh, is a lack of resources, but we are pulling from other high priority items. So my hope is that we're going to be able to have this for every single adult in America. Um, we will know more about that in the upcoming weeks, I think. Thank you for that. And let me follow up for a second. So we've been talking about BA5 and, and, and how our treatments and our vaccines have to evolve with the disease, right? Yeah. Are there other strains besides BA5? Or, I mean, is one way to think about this that these strains have been more contagious and, and, and avoiding the immune responses, but on the other hand, less deadly in some mm. ways and, and yeah. more contagious, the way we know viruses tend to evolve, right? They become more contagious and less deadly. And so do you imagine, not asking you to predict the future, but do you imagine that that's the way this virus continues to evolve and that's the types of strains we're seeing? Or are you still watching for yet another really deadly variant? Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, so uh, viruses do become more contagious or more immune evasive over time, because if you think about it, that's what gives them their kind of natural advantage. If a virus was less contagious, it would not be able to outcompete what's out there, right? So the, ev the, the, the evolutionary pressure on the virus is to find a way around the immunity wall that we have built up. If you think of our country as having a complex immunity wall based on vaccines and prior infections, the, the incentive of the virus is try to find a way around it so it can it can replicate. So that's why we keep seeing an evolution of the virus that may, keeps it very contagious. You know, on the question of whether viruses always evolve towards becoming less lethal, there are examples where that is the case, and there are plenty of examples where that is not the case, where viruses have actually gotten more lethal over time or have kept the same level of lethality. Um, I think we are lucky with Omicron um, that it was less lethal uh, but there is unfortunately nothing in the history of viral evolution that lets me rest assured that the future variants will be less lethal or even just as lethal as, as Omicron and not worse. So we always plan for, you know, a bad case scenario where a virus, a version of the virus could come in and that could be much more deadly, could be much more deadly to a specific population, could be much more deadly overall. 
Um, obviously, all the vaccinations, the boosting is going to give our immune system a tremendous leg up in preventing the worst outcomes. Um, but there's still plenty of people who are under vaccinated. There are even some people who are not vaccinated at all. Uh, and they're going to be at very elevated risk. So we have to do everything we can to keep building up that immunity. And we plan for that scenario where you get a virus that could be quite deadly. Obviously, we hope that we never do. And we hope that this virus continues to be less and less serious of a disease. But, but unfortunately, uh, as you know, the old saying, hope is not a strategy. Um, we plan for a variety of scenarios. And it is entirely possible we could end up with something that's just as serious or worse over time. I'm going to speak for all of America right now when I say hard pass. No, thank you <laughs> to that option. <laughs> I know. I know. But, but, we but, gotta, but we're going to plan for it, right? We're going to plan right, for it right. in the outside chance that that's what happens. That's right. Um, so interesting talking about how vaccines and therapeutics might react to new strains. We get the same questions about um tests. And so Dr. Fauci was on this program and said, you know, these antigen tests aren't all going to be able to detect all strains. And so how do you feel about the antigen tests that are out there now? Yeah. You know, uh, let me tell you how they're performing right now. And then we can talk about what might happen over time. Right now, the antigen tests still are working quite well. And let me explain what they're good at and what they're less good at. The antigen test, and the reason why these new subvariants have not yet caused a huge problem with the antigen test is because the antigen is actually looking for a different part of the virus than what is evolving. What's evolving is the spike protein of the virus, but the antigen is looking for the nucleocapsid protein. It's just a different protein of the virus that is not actually evolving that much. So the, the, the antigen tests continue to work just fine. But then the question is, what are they working fine in? What are they doing? Antigen tests turn positive when you have a high enough viral load that it's going to cause you to be able to be contagious and transmit it. So if you think about somebody who gets infected, there's a period of time when they're positive, and maybe on a PCR test, but they're not yet contagious. During that period, the antigen test will be negative. So people say, oh, the antigen test isn't working, except it's not really a test to know whether you're infected or not. It's a test to know whether you're contagious or not, right? So once you get into that contagious period where you have a lot of virus in your nose, in your throat, the antigen tests turn positive. And then as that contagiousness goes down over time, you may still have symptoms, you may still be testing positive on PCR, but if you're no longer contagious, the antigen test will turn negative. And so people often say, well, does that mean the test isn't working? If your goal is just diagnosis, yeah, sometimes the test will be negative when you actually have the virus. If your goal is contagiousness, the, the test is quite good. The reason this becomes very important is, again, going back to thinking about my elderly parents. Um, now, they just had COVID, but again, a couple of months ago, I went and visited them. My whole family did. And everybody took a test before we went in to see my parents. And we knew that because people had tested negative, there was a high degree, not 100%, but a high degree of assurance that no one was contagious during that visit. So I think tests continue to play a really important role in keeping infection levels low and protecting high-risk people, even if they're not perfect at always catching infection. I think that's the most clear explanation I've heard of that and, and, and really helpful. Thank you for that. We'll make sure that we get that message out far and wide. So another question we get a lot is, you know, President Biden just had a rebound case and there are questions about, is that particular to this strain? Is it helped along by the therapeutic that he took? How can you help enlighten our audience about these rebound cases? Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about rebound. They've been most well characterized with the drug Paxlovid. Though, by the way, we see rebound even in people who don't take any treatment at all. And let me talk about what it is and what it means. Those are two separate ideas. So what is it, first of all? What happens with rebound, and we've seen this throughout the whole pandemic, is you know you, you get a big viral load, over time it declines, you start feeling better, and then you get a bump up again. And we don't always know why that happens. We see it in people who don't take any treatments at all. We've seen a lot more of it with Paxlovid. So then the question is, what's going on? Is Paxlovid causing it? Is it resistance? So first of all, it's not resistance. What happens is Paxlovid is such a powerful antiviral that even if you start taking, let's say, day one, day two, and you've got a high level of virus, it immediately suppresses the amount of virus you have and really shuts it down. You take your five-day course, your viral level is very low. And then after five days, as Paxlovid stops, 
you in some percentage of people, five, 10 percent of people, there's still a little bit of virus left and you see that virus level come back up. And so people will sometimes develop new symptoms. Sometimes they'll go from testing negative to testing positive. It's not great. Obviously, we wish it didn't happen. But here are the two key points that you need to know about rebound. One is actually three. One is it can happen without Paxlovid too, even under just normal circumstances. Second is um, that the rebound tends to be relatively mild. Now, there's occasional stories of somebody who got a more serious rebound, but those are pretty rare. And third, and most importantly, when we have tracked rebound cases and said what happens to people when they get rebound, they don't end up in the hospital. They don't end up dying. So the goal of Paxlovid is to prevent you from getting seriously ill, to prevent you from having to go to the hospital or ICU or worse. And for that, rebound or no rebound, Paxlovid is working exquisitely well. So I, I hear a lot about rebound. Our president had rebound. But, you know, here, here, here he is, 79 years old, leader of the free world, uh, got COVID, did great, thankfully. Had at worst day, he had a cough and a runny nose. Is, he never had problems with breathing, never had a fever. Really remarkable. It's a combination of vaccines and treatments. So in thinking about preparing for winter, you know, we're looking at what's going on in Australia right now. And people are calling it, you know, kind of a what's the word, twindemic, right? That they're having a huge flu spike at the same time that they're having this big COVID spike. And so, two questions: Is that how we should be thinking about winter here? And if so, how do we prepare for it from a public health standpoint, but also from a business standpoint? How are we preparing to run our businesses, serve our customers in what could be a tough winter? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about flu and how it interacts with COVID. So we've had two winters where we've had relatively little flu, almost no flu. Um, fantastic. And by the way, why did we have two winters with little to no flu? It's actually because of all the mitigation that we put in. There was, there was actually still a good amount of mask wearing in both winters. There was a good amount of, of social distancing, avoiding those large crowds. That is going to be different this winter. I expect this fall and winter to look much more like the fall and winter of 2019 than the last two years with a lot less mitigation. And that means we should be ready for more flu and more COVID. Now, two points here. One is under normal non-pandemic times, flu really stretches our healthcare system. I, I you know, before I took on my current job, I was working as a hospitalist in, uh, in the VA healthcare system and other systems I've worked in. I'll tell you, in December, January, when I was in the hospital, it was packed. It was always packed because of the flu. Throw in COVID on top of that, our healthcare system is going to get into serious trouble unless we are very proactive about preventing it. So if we do nothing and just sort of hope for the best, I think we could end up getting into a lot of trouble this fall and winter. So here's how we're thinking about preventing that. First of all, I think it's going to be really, really important for people to get this updated uh, new, uh, very specific uh, COVID vaccine, because I think it's going to help a lot in preventing infections. And I think it's going to help a lot in keeping people out of the hospital. Second, it's going to be really important for people to get the flu shot. I know I've now talked to you about two shots and nobody loves shots, except two shots to prevent you from ending up in the hospital where you'd end up getting a lot more shots is, in my mind, the best deal there is. And they're both going to be widely available and free. So that's one part. Second is I do think we have to make real efforts at mitigation. And what do I mean by that? One of the most important things we should be doing, and I think business leaders need to be doing it, school leaders need to be doing it, is improving indoor air quality. I mentioned earlier with the CDC guidance, recognition that poor quality ventilation is a major cause of spread. We should be doing a lot to upgrade ventilation in indoor air spaces. If we do that, I think that'll make an enormous difference. You know, I can imagine in crowded indoor spaces, people uh, being encouraged to wear high quality masks. I think that will keep infections down. And then widespread availability of testing. So when people are infected, when people get sick, they test if they're testing positive, either for the flu or for... Um, COVID, that they are not then go, don't go out and infect other people. Last but not least, making sure we have plenty of treatments so that people don't end up in the hospital. If we do all of those things, I am confident we keep every business open. We keep every school open. We don't have to like have hospitals that are overwhelmed and can't take care of other people. And we can get through what might be a tough fall and winter. You know, you raised a really interesting point about hospital overload, even pre-pandemic in flu season. 
and we know what happened uh, to some hospitals, to most hospitals during the pandemic. What we hear a lot about is the problem of worker shortage, the problem of nurse or nursing shortages in particular, early retirements due to COVID, uh, et cetera. My question to you is, what do we do to relieve healthcare worker burnout so that we don't lose even more healthcare workers this winter? Yeah, yeah, you know, so it's a really good question. Um, you know, when the pandemic first hit, if you go back to March, April, May, every healthcare worker, you know, sort of, even ones who were on the verge of retirement or even who had retired came back in and said, we're gonna work 24 seven to get the country through this. And they did, and we got through um, I had friends, you know, flying in from California to go work in hospitals in New York. Um, we all pulled together and it was pretty exhausting, but we got through it and got to the summer. Uh, and then the fall and winter were pretty horrible. This is fall of 20 uh, into winter 2021. Got through that. Then Delta hit this past summer a year ago. And again, people pulled together. And what you have is a healthcare workforce that is, that is I think, at this point, pretty spent. And so when I think about the fall and winter, and especially the, given the question, you know, last question about the twindemic and flu and COVID and how contagious the current COVID is, I worry, because remember, it's not just that you need healthcare workers to take care of COVID and flu. You need healthcare workers to take care of appendicitis and car accidents and heart attacks and strokes and cancer and all of those things. And we have a healthcare workforce that is spent, that is exhausted. And if we want to do something for them, the best thing we can do is make sure we don't have another run on hospitals this fall and winter. And one of the things we see when you do have shortages and you have a run on hospitals is mortality rates start going up because it just becomes harder and harder to take care of people uh, when hospitals are overwhelmed. So number one is we've got to make sure that we don't tax our healthcare system any more than we do. Um, second is I really do think there's a lot of work that needs to go into uh, dealing with the burnout that healthcare workers are facing. And certainly, a lot of them have faced a lot of abuse and a lot of anger over this pandemic. We've got to really try to bring that temperature down. Um, we've got to pull together. Healthcare workers are an essential part of our society functioning, and we've got to do everything we can to protect them in the weeks and months ahead. So we talked a little bit about businesses. We talked a little bit about healthcare workers. Let's talk about schools. You know, How should teachers and parents best be preparing to go back to school? Because as you know, that's part of the worker shortage, right? If, if yeah. kids can't be back at school in childcare centers, then their parents can't be off working. And so what can we all do yeah. to keep schools open and, and how should parents be preparing? Yeah, so I think first and, and foremost is sort of that, again, clear goal setting, right? So I started off with, and I will say again, um, there's only one goal when, inside the administration when we talk about this and talk about schools. Uh, everybody remembers that there's only one goal here, and the goal is every kid full time, you know, back in school full time, um, uh, in person, right? That's the goal, and that's what we have to do. And we can do that, by the way. There, that's not some aspirational goal. I think that is what we should be working towards. So there's a bunch of things we can do from a policy point of view. There's a bunch of things school leaders can do, and there's a bunch of things parents can do. So let's talk about all of them. Certainly from the administration end, we want to make sure we make vaccines widely available and easy to get, treatments widely available. We are sending out tens of millions of tests to school districts. Um, and Congress literally you know, allocated uh, tens of billions of dollars to schools for improving ventilation. So the resources are out there for schools to do everything they need to do to keep kids and teachers and everybody else safe and, and open. School districts need to be using those resources. They've got billions of dollars. They need to be making those upgrades in ventilation and filtration. It makes an enormous difference in reducing spread of not just COVID, but also flu and other viruses. Um, I think school districts should have a plan for how they're going to use tests. Some schools may use serial testing. Other schools may use tests for high-risk events, or they may use tests uh, when kids are symptomatic or teachers are symptomatic. But basically making sure that they're doing that is really important. And obviously encouraging the vaccination of children, of adults, so make sure that everybody's up to date. And then from a parent's point of view, and I think about it, I have three kids who are in school. Uh, thankfully, they're, they've all been back uh, full time for a while. Um, when I think about my responsibility as a parent, certainly one of them is when my kid is sick to not send them to school. That's hard because you're tempted, uh, but it's important because that's how you get big outbreaks in schools. So being able to keep kids home when they're uh, symptomatic and not feeling well, I think that's important. 
Um, but also parents have always had a very big role to play in demanding accountability from schools. Um, you know, school districts, as I said, have gotten tens of billions of dollars. Uh, let's make sure that they're using it for improving ventilation and filtration. Not many schools have, some schools have not. There is a place for accountability where parents, I think, in a respectful way can engage with their schools and say, hey, what are we doing to make that better? Um, again, there's a lot of work here, but I am confident we now have all the tools and capabilities uh, to keep every school open full time in person all year. You ended on uh, ventilation, and we talked about that just a second ago. It prompted an audience question, which is, if this is so important, should we be prioritizing air quality in public spaces? Yes, absolutely. Look, let me let me put it this way. There are some short-term things we've had to do in a pandemic. We've asked everybody to wear a mask. We've uh, done regular testing. These are not long-term sustainable things. We're not gonna have a mask mandate. We barely have any mask mandates at all now, but we're not gonna have them uh, for the long run. So then the question is, do we just live in a society where we tolerate exquisitely high levels of respiratory infections where people are getting sick all the time? I think the short answer is no, we shouldn't tolerate that at all. Not when we can make systematic fixes. We have the technology and capability. So improving indoor air quality in public spaces, to me, is one of the most important things we can be doing as a society. And this is a responsibility. I've talked about it for school, um, you know, school leaders, business leaders. You all have buildings. You ask people to come into that building. If that building is full of polluted air, uh, infected air, that is not great. We can do a lot there. And by the way, the fixes for these things don't tend to be that expensive. But it's been interesting to me learned a lot about indoor air quality and ventilation and filtration in the last two years. Um, there are a lot of companies that'll sell you very fancy technologies, but there are a lot of very simple technologies, uh, basic filters, basic air purifiers uh, that cost, you know, $50, $100. And again, depending on the size of things, obviously many hundreds and sometimes thousands, but uh, depending on the building. But the bottom line is these are not major upgrades of technology. These are things that most people can do. You can almost always, no matter how good your air is, you can almost always make your indoor air quality better. And that's what we should be pushing for. So your comment about the new booster is drawing a lot of audience questions. Let me group a couple of them together. One is, I've never been vaccinated. Can I start with the new booster because it might have the best chance of protecting me? Yes, that's why we did the bivalent. So we did this bivalent where we have part of the original and then part of the Omicron new one. We could have gone for just Omicron, but it would not have provided enough protection for people who have not gotten any vaccines or who've only maybe gotten one shot in the past. So this is part of the reason we went it is we, want, we went with this path is it gives a very broad amount of protection and so if you have not gotten vaccinated at all, this, again, not today, because it's not available yet, but in about three weeks, assuming FDA, CDC do their thing, um, this should be available. It's a great time to start a new series, and you can start that new series with the new bivalent vaccines. So what if I haven't had my second booster? Should at this point, should I wait three weeks? <laughs> Maybe one of the hardest <laughs> questions yet, because we're so close. You know, if we were a month ago, I would have said, don't wait, go get it. Um, it's tough, right? Because you, so I always believe that being more protected is better than less protected. So I still think there's an argument to be made. You can go and get that second booster today and then go get your new bivalent vaccine maybe in a couple of months. You will want to space that out at least a little bit, probably four to eight weeks. Um, so my general feeling is, you know, no time, no reason to wait, go get it. Even today, even though we're only a few weeks away, if I were if I were that person, I'd probably go ahead and get that second booster today and then get the new bivalent vaccine in two months. Can I get the uh, flu shot and the booster at the same time? You, can. you don't just space that out. You don't have to space them out. You don't have to space them out. You can do it in the same day, same time. Uh, maybe in a year we'll have a technology where one shot will have both. I know companies are working on that. Uh, just not, I mean, I had you know, aspirations and hopes that maybe we would have pulled it out for this fall. It was too complicated. Uh, but that technology is being worked on. I would not be surprised if a year or two from now, it comes out into one shot for both. But but right now it's going to be two shots. You can get them on the same day, same time. Let's get the whole thing over with. So question about, we talked about schools reopening as businesses are really trying to serve their customers. We get a lot of questions at the U.S. Chamber about events. And there's been an event protocol. A lot of people, before they have a convention, for example, will make sure that all of their attendees have tested, have to turn in their results, et cetera. 
Um, and we're getting a lot of questions now about the whether or not that's still viable, whether or not it's really even doing anything if you know you're taking an antigen test at home three days before a conference. And so what is what are, how are you thinking about large scale events and the efficacy of testing? Yeah, it's a great question. This is one place where I think tests continue to have an important role. And let me make the case for it. I know with like two and a half years in the pandemic, people are like, can't believe I have to still do this. You know, I, here's why I think this is probably a good idea. As I said earlier, we do not want uh, to have large scale infections this fall and winter. We really are going to potentially get into trouble in the healthcare system and elsewhere if you have massive outbreaks. You don't want the convention you are holding to become a super spreader event where 20, 30 percent of people who attended that event end up getting infected, even if most of them don't end up in the hospital, even if most of them don't end up getting super sick. Just a very high level of infection is disruptive. People get sick. Um, for some people, it can be quite miserable. Some people go on to develop long COVID. So in general, if there are simple, easy things you can do to reduce that risk, my feeling is you should consider doing them. So what are the things you can do to reduce that risk? You can have events outdoors. Sometimes that's practical, oftentimes not practical. So that's one. Second is you can make sure you're in a space with really terrific ventilation. That is practical and you can look into that, but that's not always gonna be enough. Third, you could have an event where you ask everybody to wear a high quality mask. Okay, that'll work. Sometimes that's a good idea. I think many, many times people will say that feels really intrusive. Or you can ask people to take an antigen test the day of. I think three days before does very little, but the day of antigen test, these tests are relatively cheap, depending on the event, depending on how many people, asking people to take it, take a photo of it, show it, or use some sort of verification system is a, is a pretty reasonable idea. It will dramatically lower the risk that you're going to end up having a super spreader event. You know, do I think you have to do this? No, but I actually think like when I've, we've held events here at the White House, we ask everybody to test that day, mostly because I don't want people to come to an event that we have pulled together and then have a large chunk of them end up getting infected. So while we're on businesses, you know, the, the businesses who want to serve customers, keep their employees healthy and, and be operational all winter, what advice do you have? I mean, I hear, I hear you about ventilation. We just heard some advice about testing for events. What else should business owners be thinking about? Yeah, I think the single biggest thing, if you want to keep your employees from getting really sick, um, missing work, ending up in the hospital, I, I know I'm going to sound like you, you can predict what I'm going to say, um, make sure they're up to date on their vaccines. It really does turn out. If you think about why are we in a, such a different place today than where we were two years ago, why does this pandemic feel so much better right now than it did two years ago? There are about 18 different factors, but one trumps all of them, and that's the level of vaccines we have and vaccinations. So I think the single biggest thing you can do to keep your employees safe, prevent disruption in the workplace, prevent people from getting really sick, is doing everything you can to encourage your employees to be up to date on vaccines. And I think the bivalent vaccines we're going to have in the fall are going to be a really important part of that. So I think that's number one. I think number two and again, I'm not going to talk about ventilation and testing because we've covered those. I really do think number two is making sure that you have a plan with your employees. Talk to them about treatments. Talk to them about getting tested early. If they wake up one morning, they have a cough, a scratchy throat, fever. Get a test because the number one reason you want to know is so then you, if, you, if you have COVID, you can get treated. Um, again, a large majority of adults are likely uh, uh, eligible. Not everybody. If, you're, if you have a 20-year-old totally healthy person, Probably not going to benefit much, Not would not be eligible for cut packs of it. But lots of people are. And making sure they get treated helps them recover faster, uh, helps them get back to work faster. Not necessarily that's always the goal, but that's an important goal. The most important thing is you're going to keep your employees happy and health, not happy, but healthy um, and happy too, I suppose, uh, but healthy. And it will. It's going to have impacts on productivity. It's going to have impacts on return to work. There are lots of reasons why tr uh, early treatment is a really, really good thing. So vaccines and treatments, I think, are critical. We've talked about the role of testing uh, and then whatever you can do to make that indoor air quality better. Will be helpful. Let me switch topics for just a minute to a new public health crisis, which is monkeypox. What should the public know about it? How is it impacting the fight against COVID? How should we all be thinking about this? Yep. Yeah. 
So let's take a minute to talk about monkeypox. This is a virus that's been around for a long time. We've known about it uh, for at least 60 years. The current outbreak is different. It's, uh, it's a different uh, version of the virus than, than many of the outbreaks we've seen in the past. Um, here's what we know right now. About 95 plus percent of the cases, both here in the US, UK, Europe, rest of Europe, about 95% of cases are among gay and bisexual men. So it's pretty confined right now to one community. That's important for two reasons. One is it allows us to target our efforts, vaccines, treatments, education, testing to those communities most effective. And second, it helps other people understand that they're not at elevated risk if you're not part of that community, right? So um, it means everybody does not have to go out and get a monkeypox vaccine. It means that everybody does not have to worry that every time they have a little uh, ward on their hand or some sort of a little lesion that, oh my God, could it be monkeypox? We have not seen it spread casually. Technically, it can spread through surfaces. We have not seen much evidence of that. Um, technically, it can spread through casual quick contact. We have not seen much evidence of that. The evidence suggests it's mostly spread during sexual activity, prolonged skin-to-skin -skin contact. And therefore, most people, I think at this point, if you're not part of that community, do not have to be particularly concerned. Now, we're going to watch this closely. That changes over time. Obviously, we'll communicate that uh, early and often. But right now, that's where it is. And last point on this. This is why I think I'm not worried about it for schools. And again, it doesn't mean we don't pay attention. Obviously, if there's a kid who's got a who's got a lesion, you're going to want to investigate that. But I'm not worried about large outbreaks in schools. I'm not worried about large outbreaks in businesses. You may uh, get, you occasionally see somebody or one of your employees or one of your customers who may end up getting it. But the truth is that they're unlikely to get it in most normal uh, situations. It's really spreading through intimate contact. And that's where monkeypox largely is affecting things right now. Thank, thank you for that. I've got one other audience question, and then I have a lift up question I want to ask you as well. The last audience question is uh, kind of a twofer, which is, is the booster safe for pregnant women, if you know that? And also related, what can we do as families to get the vaccination rate up for, for kids under five? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about pregnant women, and then let's talk about kids under five. Um. The vaccines have now been given to tens of millions of pregnant women. We're talking about these mRNA vaccines. They are extremely safe. We have seen little to no side effects, the same side effects that most of us get, you know, the sore arm, the uh, 24 hours of sometimes feeling fatigue and a little bit um, uh, run down, but the same effects on, on pregnant women, but have not seen any major untoward effects. But here's what we do know. Pregnant women who get COVID have extremely high rates of complications for their baby. Women themselves end up getting very, very sick. Uh, substantial increased risk of, of hospitalizations and even deaths among pregnant women uh, from COVID itself. So COVID is a huge risk factor and vaccines are exceedingly safe. So I have been unequivocal in my counseling of pregnant women. If you are pregnant, you should go get the vaccine. These are the, the booster, the new booster that's coming out uh, in the fall is a is essentially a reformulation of, of something we've already used. So I expect we're going to see the same safety profile in pregnant women. And again, the, the getting infected itself is such a risk factor that very, very important that people get, get vaccinated. You know, on kids under five, here's what I will say, Suzanne, two things. First um, is there's been a lot of, I would argue, uh, poor quality information, misinformation, confusing information about COVID and kids. So let's actually clear the air about that. Of course, it is true that COVID is much less risky in kids than it is in the elderly. By the way, that is true for pretty much every disease that we have. Flu for in a 10-year-old is less risky than flu in an 80-year-old, right? That is a truism that we see over and over again. Um, cancers are less risky, even when kids get cancer, less likely to get super sick than but we don't say cancer is not a big deal in kids because we don't compare children to the elderly. When I think about my kids' risk, I don't think about how it compares to my elderly parents' risk. The way we typically think about children's health is we say, how does this risk compare to other risks that they face? Not other risks that elderly people face, but other risks that they face. In that context, it turns out, and the data is very clear on this, 
that COVID is one of the major causes of serious illness in children. Thankfully, kids don't get seriously ill. But to the extent that they do, we've seen a lot of kids get pretty seriously ill from COVID. So that's sort of point number one. And point number two is we have now given out children, vaccines to kids um, hundred, tens of millions of times, maybe even hundreds of millions, but definitely tens of millions of times with little to no in the uh, way of untoward effects, side effects. So put together incredible safety profile, clear evidence that kids can end up in the hospital, can get very sick from this virus. And to me, it's a no brainer. So I think last point on this is, you know, I can give you all the data. I can tell you, I will give you two pieces of, of anecdote that I think are really important. One is the day my children became eligible to get vaccinated. Within a week, both all three of them had gotten uh, their appointments and they've all gotten vaccinated and boosted. So part of it is, you know, I can say what I say, but you got to look at what I do. Um, the second part is look at pediatricians. I don't know a single pediatrician who has not gotten their children, including kids under five, fully vaccinated. So that's what pediatricians are doing. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians have all come out unequivocally on vaccinating kids under five. When the doctors you trust to take care of your kids for everything else are telling you this is a really good idea, maybe worth listening. We had some of those same experts on this show with a similar message, and I'm glad to I'm glad to continue to get it out. You know, it's interesting what you just said about some of the misinformation or or lack of information that's out there. And as you know, it's part of what we've tried to do through Path Forward is get to communities and chambers across the country and really have some facts and experts out there. One thing you said. Uh, recently was that part of the reason that the pandemic still isn't over is that we got the biological science right, but not the social science right. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Yeah, this is um, this has been part of the humbling experience of being a, you know, somebody who has thought about and studied pandemics uh, for years. I, I did a lot of work on pandemic preparedness. And then when I think about what did I get right and what did I get wrong, plenty, plenty that I got wrong. Uh, but one of the things was um, that, well, let's start with what I was pleasantly surprised by. The biological science, the ability to get these vaccines built, tested, and deployed within a year, phenomenal, right? Amazing success of human ingenuity, incredible work by the private sector, close partnership with government and academia. It was America at its best. It was awesome. So we really did get that stuff right. The social science of building trust, of countering misinformation, of not politicizing the most basic of public health measures, um, that part turned out to be much, much harder than I think many of us expected. I had a mental model three years ago, and now you're going to see how naive I was. My mental model was you get the science right, you build great vaccines, you build good treatments, everybody will come and get it, the pandemic will be over, we're going to be in great shape. Turns out, not so simple. I will say one thing, which is, again, the power of, of these vaccines. Right now, we have four to 500 Americans still dying every day. If everybody was up to date on their vaccines and people got treated with Paxlovid as they're supposed to, deaths would go to close to zero across America. So the deaths are still happening because of that gap between what we know works and what is happening out of the front lines. That means I think we have to rely more on trusted voices I think it is imperative for political and, and business and social leaders. Uh, look, we can fight about lots of stuff. We can fight about all the things that in America we've always loved fighting about. But when we, when we can rally around the importance of vaccines, importance of treatments, importance of getting people care they need, it actually makes an enormous difference. And we've got to all work harder at that. Those issues of trust, of of um, engaging people, of using voices that people believe in and have long-standing relationships with, those tools are going to be really important as we fight the rest of this pandemic. Um, science has delivered for us. Now it's our job to figure out how to do the rest of it. It's interesting to have that conversation and, and hear you make those points, because I know one of the things you're also working on is how do you plan for a post-pandemic world? So how do you plan for that science and how do you plan for that social science? And so maybe I'll give you the last word on, you know, how you're thinking about what we've all been hoping and praying for, which is the new normal. Yeah, that's a great question. So maybe a good way to end. You know, we have been doing a lot of thinking inside the administration about what does 
the post acute phase of the pandemic and uh, uh, what, what does it look like? You know, it's interesting. Part of the question people often ask is, well, how does a pandemic end? How do we know the pandemic has ended? Has it ended already? And there's an old phrase by a, a, a medical historian, a science historian, uh, and the phrase is, you know, pandemics end with a whimper, not with a bang. Pandemics often begin with a bang, like February, March of 2020. That was a bang. Like, oh my God, the world changed. Pandemics fade into the background. And they end in some ways when society comes to a new normal. And we have been thinking a lot about how do we enable a new normal that's healthier, that's stronger, that leaves us in better shape. Um, one of the things we've spent a lot of time thinking about in the last many months, and we're going to continue this work, and you'll hear more from the administration on this, is getting us out of that acute emergency phase where the U.S. government is buying the vaccines, buying the treatments, buying the diagnostic tests. We need to get out of that business over the long run. And so my hope is that in 2023, um, you're going to see the commercialization of almost all of these products. Some of it is actually going to begin this fall. Uh, in the days and weeks ahead, you're going to see commercialization of some of these things. So we just move them into the regular healthcare system. And so if you need a treatment, you get a treatment the way you'd get treatments for heart disease and other viruses and, and bacteria and other kinds of things. So that's going to be really important. That commercialization work is happening. There are regulatory issues. There are market dynamic issues. There are transition issues so that Right now, everybody can walk into a CVS and get a vaccine. I want to make sure that when we make this transition, we don't end up in a point where nobody can get a vaccine because we didn't get the transition right. So we want to do it carefully, thoughtfully, make sure we've got un, uh, uninsured and underinsured people covered. Um, that work is happening. And as I said, just to give you a bit of a timeline, some of it you'll see in the fall. Most of it you're going to see in 2023. So the government gets out of this business. Really important for the government to continue making investments in next generation of vaccines, uh, making investments in building up science capability, building investments in preventing. So the next time we get a respiratory pathogen, our indoor air quality has been so much better. Our ability to build diagnostic tests and platforms is so better that we can just respond much more effectively. That's Those are the kinds of investments I think the government can and should be making. Most of those investments go to the private sector because that's where so much of the innovation is. But this business of kind of day-to-day -day running of a pandemic, that needs to transition. And we are working very hard to make sure that transition is in a very kind of uh, orderly, a very transparent way so everybody sees it. Dr. Shah, thank you so much for a very clear explanation, for very clear advice for businesses and families across the country who very much want to get to the new normal. Thanks also for the recognition of the role of the private sector and getting us to the other side. And we appreciate you being with us today very much. Suzanne, thank you. It was a pleasure and I look forward to coming back at some point in the future if I could be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, we do too. Thanks very much. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Our next episode will take place on September 13th with Accenture's North American CEO, Jimmy Etheridge. We're going to talk about the grave impact this pandemic has had on mental health and how employers can help. We'll see you then. In the meantime, take care.